All right, everyone, it is the top of the hour. So we're going to go ahead and get started with our next session. And that session is an introduction to the Archive Space API and Archive Stake with presenter Dave Mayo from Harvard University. In working with Archive Space, there comes a time in everyone's working life where one needs to interrogate their data or mark cha make changes across a large part or all of their collections. While Archive Space has some affordances built in for bulk editing and reporting, its API can be an invaluable tool, able to, with effort, interrogate and alter any piece of data in the system. Migrations, custom reporting and analysis, bulk edits or deletions, integrations with other software, familiarity with the API, API makes all of these and more possible, if not necessarily easy. This presentation will That's hopefully good. provide you with some of the context necessary to get started working with the Archive Space API and demonstrate with examples usage of the API using the Archive Snake library, a Python library specifically designed to reduce the effort required to write scripts interacting with Archive Space via its API. So with that, I will turn things over to Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Dave Mayo, uh, and uh, this is intended as an introduction to the Archive Space API and Archive Snake. Um, it's going to be focusing more on the API, trying to give you sort of general concepts and a sort of roadmap for how you can get started working with it. Um, Specifically, this is this is meant to re um, this like the Archive Snake library is designed to reduce the effort that's required to write scripts interacting with Archive Space. So there are a lot of use cases for the API. Um, some of the most common ones are data migrations, um, data cleanup, bulk data deletion, reporting, and integration with other systems. Um, my personal experience with Archive Space started with um, a migration of a large EAD corpus into Harvard University's Archive Space instance. Um, so I'm very familiar with migration, uh, the data cleanup that comes after migration, and the bulk data deletion that uh, comes uh, in the course of using the system a lot. Um, but fundamentally, anything you can do in the application you can do in the API because the application is written in terms of of the API. Um, that that's how the staff interface that everyone uses um, does its business. Um, so really, being able to write scripts against the API is uh, a very powerful tool for being able to do things with Archive Space across large collections of records and. Um, uh, over a reasonable period of time. So I'm going to talk some API basics. Uh, I know people have probably heard what is an API uh, enough times that they're tired of it, but uh, I want to make sure we have our terms defined when we start. So an API is an application programming interface, which is a means for one program to interact with another program. It's essentially a set of instructions for how you communicate with a system. Um, informally, when we're talking about an API in the context of web applications like Archive Space, we mean using a set of URIs to get things from, add things to, and trigger behaviors in a target system. This is accomplished by making H requests, HTTP requests in this case, of various sorts um, to the application. Um, when we talk about working with the API, we're talking about writing and running scripts that make requests to these URIs. Um, it's possible to make requests um, in with other things than, than programs or scripts. Um, like there's an application called Postman, which lets you sort of craft individual requests. Um, there's like web browsers make requests, um, but we're primarily concerned with scripting tasks against the API um, as part of doing batch editing work or reporting or that sort of thing. So some of those URIs are um, displayed on the screen now. Um, there, this is a screenshot of the documentation. Um, as you can see, the URIs have a route, which is the URI to where, where that particular method lives in the API. There's the method um, post, get, delete. Um, you're not going to see any other methods than those. Um, post is used for both creating and updating records. 
get is used for reading them and delete is used for deleting them, strangely enough. Um, archive space as a system is broken up into the following components, which are basically separate programs, um, even though they're bundled together as an application. Um, so most people experience it as archive space, the system, but what it really is, is a, um, a sort of collected system made up of the front end, which is the staff interface, the public interface, the indexer, which exists to put uh, the records in a fast retrieval and search system called Solar, and the back end, which is the part that talks to the database and uh, has sort of fundamental control over updating and uh, taking actions on records. And this is the part that you connect to via the API. Um, so in terms of the, the first thing you need to think about in terms of the API is where is it? How do I get access? Um, there's documentation on the API here, which is important. And the API in an installed archive space, which is what most of your production systems and, and QA systems will be, is located by default at localhost 8089 on whatever server is running archive space. If you're running it from a GitHub checkout for because you're doing development on Archive Space, um, it's running on localhost 4567. Um, this one of the consequences of it running on localhost on a port that's not the standard HTTP port is that there's not necessarily like just because you have an Archive Space instance doesn't mean that things outside that server can see it. Um, you need to either forward that port to another web service or expose that port in some way if you want to use the API on a production system. Um, and this is well beyond the scope of what I can talk about here, but um, it's um, there's some information on how to do it and um, whoever's administering the system should be able to help you if you have someone administering the system. So, um, we're going to talk about some general concepts um, around specifically the archive space API. Um, the, these are sort of general um, categories of things that you'll encounter in the API, and hopefully this will make it um, easy to understand it as a system rather than as the individual like segments of it. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is JSON and JSON model. So JSON is a serialization format for data, which is uh, which can contain the following types of things. It can contain strings, which are, um, uh, for anyone not familiar with the term, it's um, uh, like a, a list of characters, like words, text, values. Um, it can contain numbers. Um, it can contain objects, um, which are essentially um, collections of values that have a key value a key value structure um, and you can arbitrarily nest those and then it can contain arrays which are essentially um, ordered lists of things um, and those can contain any any of the following the various objects include like including other objects and arrays um, and then it contains a special null value which signifies that there's that which signifies that there's nothing there. Um, it also it also accepts true and false, which I've left out of this example by accident. So, um, oh, and for anyone who's not familiar with what a serialization format is, a serialization format is essentially a, a way that you can write data to disk that you can then um, turn back into data in a, in a system. So JSON schema is a schema language for JSON. Um, it's expressed in JSON, which is nice. Um, so it's essentially JSON objects that describe the structure of other JSON. Um, the full sort of discussion, like the full description and uh, any sort of tutorial on it is, is outside the scope of this, but the documentation is genuinely, uh, is generally pretty good and um, should be helpful if you want to learn more about this. Um, for right now, we're just going to 
take a look at a very simple example. Um, so this is a full JSON model. This is a full JSON schema that describes an object um, that has a name property whose type is string and if missing, it's, it's incorrect. So um, here is an object that matches the schema um, name David Mayo in Tarot Bank. Um, archive space records via the API are mostly returned as JSON. I'll come back to that mostly later. And this JSON is described by a schema which is fetchable via the API. Um, you don't need to understand the code part of this right now, but this is essentially um, a me fetching in creating an archive space client here and then getting the URI schemas subcontainer um, and printing it out as JSON. As you can see, there's a schema here. Um, one thing to note is that these, these URLs here are not necessarily, these URIs here are not necessarily representations of things accessible on the web. They, they're, they're like the namespace URLs in XML where they're a unique identifier for that particular schema. Um, and it says all of the various properties it can have. Um, and there's a lot more than we can actually display on the screen at once. Um, you can also get a list of schemas. Um, this actually returns all of the schemas in one big JSON object. Um, but I just pulled out the keys to show you that there's quite a few schemas. And additionally, if you'll notice how there's abstract agent and then agent family, agent person, agent corporate entity, et cetera, um, JSON model schema is hierarchical and um, you can have uh, essentially inheritance. So agent family will have a key in it that says parent that points to abstract agent. And what that means is that agent families everything in the abstract agent schema applies as well as the things in agent family. So it's essentially um, the descendant ones build upon the parent ones to create the full schema um, in, ca in cases where there's an inheritance like that. So some fun facts about the schema. Um, they're not currently published anywhere as far as I know. So there's not anywhere you can go to look at the schemas in a web browser or download the schemas for use with, um, for use with validation tools or anything like that. Um, but the schema is generated in the application by Ruby source code that looks very similar to JSON model schema, um, which you can go and look at. Um, uh, here is a where they live. They're in uh, the GitHub repository for archive space under common schemas, and they look something like this. Um, you can see that the primary difference is that um, some of the key values have a colon in front of them instead of being surrounded by quotations, and instead of having a colon between uh, a key and a value in an object, you have this. Um, I believe the old term for it at least is hash rocket, but you have an equal sign and a uh, greater than. Um, other than that, it should it should be almost identical. Um, oh, and null will be spelled nil. Um, one thing to keep in mind also, if you're looking at the schema, is that there are restrictions on objects that aren't described by the schema. Um, essentially, these are things like cross checks between different record types, um, where, uh, where if you have a condition that applies to, for instance, top containers and the records linked to the top containers, um, because that can't be represented in any of the single schemas, um, that validation is in a separate place in the archive space code. Um, you also, um, database constraints can exist that aren't represented in the schema. Generally, where that's a single, any place where that's a single uh, record type, that's generally an oversight or omission. So, JSON model objects are 
are JSON, and they're JSON that is um, matches a specific set of formats. Ma JSON that matches these uh, these schemas. Um, there's generally about there are generally three types of things that get returned to the system, two of which are are related to the JSON model stuff I'm about to talk to, and one of which is just literal values. So most of the things that you'll encounter are in terms of being returned by the system are JSON model objects. This is JSON that represents a single record of a particular kind. Um, the structure of these is that they're a JSON object that has a key JSON model type that has the name of a schema as its value and then also contains the properties that are described by that schema. So my example, which is cut down heavily, if you have something with a JSON model type archival object, and then it'll have um, the title and it would have all the other properties that are associated with an archival object. Um, and this can include nested chains of other JSON model objects and it can um, literal values and refs. So a ref is another kind of object in the system and it represents a reference to another object in the system. Um, generally, you'll see these as values inside of other objects. Um, you don't generally see them returned directly as the whole thing you get. Um, and they're, they're like, I don't, I don't know of anything that just returns like a list of refs. Um, they're, they're pointers inside JSON model objects to other JSON model objects as a rule. Um, the structure of them is that they're an object with a key ref and with a URI in the system as the value of that key. They can, but don't always contain additional properties. Um, as an example, um, here we have a reference to repositories to. Um, that's a reference to whatever repository has the ID to. Um, the, they're normally embedded in things. So this is an example of them being embedded in a top container, um, uh, in a top container. So it's repository field has a reference that points to repositories too. Literal values are those JSON types we were talking about earlier. Strings, booleans, arrays, and numbers. These are also generally returned as values inside full objects and not as the whole thing you get. But search routes don't return JSON model objects. They return solar result sets. They basically return the, the raw output of the solar index program that is run by um, archive space as, as its search and uh, and fast return uh, like caching object. So what that looks like is a JSON object that has no JSON model type, has a set of, uh, has a bunch of things about the results of the search, is a paged thing, so it has a page one and you can request page two, page three, etc. and then has a results which has a bunch of solar objects which contain inside them the um, the JSON model object that they're talking about. Um, I'll go into that a little more detail later. Um, index routes with, with the all IDs parameter will return an array of integers. So it's just a JSON array with one, 40, seven, eight, uh, whatever the IDs are for that particular route. And there can be others. Um, there's nothing preventing uh, a route from returning arbitrarily anything. Some routes return PDFs, um, XML, like that's how you get EADs out of the system. Um, uh, in general, most most things return as JSON model, but you have to you, you have to know what it returns, which is why you consult the API documentation. So um, endpoints or routes or URIs are are essentially what the API is made up of. Um, the API is fundamentally a collection of, of URIs that you can get, post, and delete to in order to control archive space. Um, endpoints is the term used in the backend itself when defining these and is sort of the most technically correct term for the, the actual thing that does the work of it. 
um, the route or and URI sort of refers are different ways of referring to the path within the API that triggers that particular endpoint. Um, here's some uh, routes by URI. Um, so you see the agents corporate entities one with the method post is how you create a corporate entity agent. So there are rough categories of routes in the system. Um, there are CRUD routes, which means create, read, update, and delete. Um, this is sort of a generic convention for a lot of uh, web applications when talking about things that create um, and manage records. Um, there are search routes, which are, as I discussed a little before, that are for searching through multiple application types, searching through sections of the um, sections of the API or sections of archive space or different types of records. Um, and then there are sort of miscellaneous other routes, like the route to merge agents, um, the, route, the route that gives you a feed of deleted items, um, routes that get you PDF or EAD representations of various um, objects in the system. Each type of object, oh, I meant to change that. Um, each type of object in the system usually has the following CRUD routes, and it also usually has the delete route, which I left off of my table. Um, basically, the index route gets you a list of records and is usually slash name of the thing. Um, so slash repositories is the one that gets you a list of all repositories. Um, create is usually post name of slash name of the thing and it creates a new record based on JSON that you pass as the body of the post request. Um, get with an ID, the get record get, gets you the record with a known ID. So if you know the URI of something, you post a get to it and get that individual object. And then update, which changes the record, um, you post the the changed JSON to the the URI of that object which is the same as the URI and the get. And then delete, which is not appearing in this film, um, you send a delete request to this same URI. So search routes, ha Archive Space has several search routes. Um, I, I didn't, ha I don't have an exhaustive list, but some very common ones are the slash search, which is the search through all records, and slash repositories, slash ID, slash search, which is search for everything in a repository. It also has some searches for specific types of records. Um, all of these search routes have common characteristics in that you send them basically the same parameters and they return basically a solar result set in all cases. Um, some common characteristics are that they're answered from the index rather than the database. Um, this means they generally come back faster, um, but it also can mean that they, if the index is out of sync with the database, um, for instance, if you've added a bunch of records and the data in the index hasn't caught up, those records won't necessarily show up in the search yet. Um, there are two query syntaxes available. Um, solar syntax, which you pass in via the queue parameter to these methods, or a JSON model type that represents a query. Um, in my examples, I'm going to be explicit, ex exclusively showing the solar syntax because the JSON model syntax is um, a little unwieldy and uh, there's not, I, I wanted to prioritize room on the screen. Um, they all return solar reserve solar result sets, which I've described previously. And the fields that are searchable in these routes are determined by solar and not necessarily the fields of the object. Um, usually these solar fields are, uh, actually always these solar fields are derived from the fields of the object, but there can be cases where a field either isn't mapped in solar, so you can't really search, so searching on it is more difficult, or, um, a field is um, a combined field from different types of record and thus doesn't match the JSON model properties of the objects you're searching across. Um, so here's an example search. Um, so we're doing the global search 
and we're searching for any records that have their primary type as resource and their title as records from the paraphysics laboratory. Um, we've asked for one, the first page of records. And when printed out as JSON, you see we've got, um, we're, you see we're paging through them 25 at a time. It's the, the first page is one, and blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of things there. Total hits is how many records we returned. Um, I expected there to be less, but there are four. So uh, go you, paraphysical, ah, paraphysics laboratory. Um, and one thing to note is that in each of these results, you see the ID and the URI of the record are the same. And it's got several fields that are pulled out and are the fields that are indexed by solar. But it's also got a field called JSON. This has the full JSON model record uh, um, involved in the search. So from search routes, you can actually get the full record in order to um, save it or do things with it. Um, you just have to actually parse that record out of the result set um, there. So um, miscellaneous routes, these are the routes that don't map onto either of the previous categories. Um, I discussed these examples a little earlier, but here's, um, I wanted to have them printed in for the notes for um, later. These slides will be available as will be the Jupyter notebook that I used to generate the slides. So one other thing we need to talk about in a sort of general context is repository scoping. Um, most kinds of records in archive space are repository scoped, um, which just means that they're considered in a specific repository and that their routes are generally nested underneath the routes of, for the repository that they're contained within. So if you look here, repositories, repo ID, slash archival objects ID. You can't just do get archival objects ID. Um, and then if you look at the not repository scoped ones, location profiles ID, location, basically anything that is repository scoped is limited to that one repository. And things that are not repository scoped are shared among all repositories in the system. For anyone who's in the sort of, uh, I think somewhat usual case of just using repository uh, two for everything, you don't need to worry about this as much. Um, but the, the way you determine whether something's repository scoped for your per, for most purposes is to look at whether it has the repository URL on the front of its URL in the API documentation. So um, I'm going to stop and see if there's any questions that need to be addressed before I move on. Um, And then I'm going to move on. Um, I'm, I'm planning to leave a fair amount of time for questions at the end, by the way. Um, all right. So programming against the ASPACE API. Um, again, I want to say that when we're talking about working with the API, we're primarily talking about working with it from a programming language. Um, the community is sort of um, congealed around Python, um, and that's what I'll be using for my examples. Um, specifically, I'll be using Python, and I'll demonstrate authentication with requests, um, and most things with Archive Snake, which is built on top of requests. Um, any, any programming language you use probably will have an HTTP client library and be equally capable of doing this, um, but your Python, is a good choice because a lot of people are doing that work in Python. Um, other languages I've seen work done in are, I've seen a fair amount of Ruby and I've seen some JavaScript. So to authenticate to the ASPACE API, um, you use the same user and password as you have for the staff interface, um, i.e. for the application as a whole. And you have the same rights and permission either way. Um, anything you can do as a user, you can do in the API, and anything you can do as, in the API, you can do as a user, as a user in the uh, browser. The way the API handles whether or not you're logged in is it hands you a session key and keeps track of it in the database. Um, you then hand that session key back to ArchivesSpace with every subsequent request in the HTTP header 
X archive space session. So using requests, um, here's an example of logging in to the API and making a, uh, and printing out the title of a resource. So we create an HTTP session. We set up some variables with our username, password, and API URL. Note that you should not hard code the password. Um, it should be pulled from configuration or some other source that's um, more secure. Um, then we get an auth response by posting to the user's username login uh, route with a parameter password. Note that we use a post request. You never want to log in via get request because it's a security issue. Um, get requests are passed in the URL so anyone who intercepts the traffic can see them and it will show up in logs, which is bad. Um, if the auth response status code is 200, that means everything went okay. So we put the session into the default header for the HTTP session. So it'll be added to every subsequent request. And that session lives in a key in the um, JSON that gets returned by this HTTP post call. Um, if it doesn't work, we, we bail out. Um, so then we make an HTTP GET request to the repositories 24 resources 42, which is, um, and if that is successful, we set the resource, uh, we, we get the resource JSON and print out the title. So that's a fair amount of work to get um, to get one thing out of archive space. So um, next, I'm going to start talking about Archive Snake, um, which is a Python client library that's specifically meant to operate over the Aspace API. Um, it's based on and implemented on top of requests, and it has some additional, um, like basically, it's it's meant to make. Uh, some of the repetitive tasks that everyone has to do when scripting against the API um, go away and be handled for the user. Um, uh, it's um, I'm the sort of primary developer on it, and um, uh, a number of other people have helped, including uh, Greg Wiedemann and um, uh, Ruth Kitchen Tillman, um, and uh, the people at the RAC have also helped a lot, uh, the Rockefeller Archives uh, Center. Um, and they're actually contributing some more code soon. Um, so the goals of it are to make it easier to use the API, to reduce duplication of effort in the ASpace community, and to capture a body of examples and knowledge on the API. Um, the things it does right now for people are it handles the authentication and session management part. So you don't have to worry about that authentication header. And if you, um, and and by default, if uh, your session times out, it will just re-authenticate you whenever making the uh, whenever trying to make a call rather than um, failing. Um, it prepends the API's base URI to URIs um, so that you can use URIs directly from the system. Um, normally, when you're operating in Archive Snake and you want to, or in, in if you're operating on Archive Space using just a regular HTTP library. You have to manually distinguish between when you want to use the full URI because you're making an HTTP call and when you're using a URI to reference something in the system um, or to save an object, um, which can get tedious. Um, it provides a get paged method that um, automatically goes through paged routes and uh, returns like one, it returns just the JSON of the object as you go through. Um, and it can optionally load configuration from a file on startup and provide defaults so that you don't have to um, write your own configuration handling code. Um, and then it implements a structured logging facility, um, which basically gives you a log of one JSON object per log entry, um, which Sound, sounds a little sort of bookkeeper -y, but is intensely, intensely useful and is something that I really want to draw attention to because um, good logging is, is really, really important. 
So here's the same thing that we did earlier in requests, except done in Archive Snake. Um, it's relying on the fact that the default arguments are correct because I'm just using a um, local development server. Um, but we create a client here. Um, we get the resource response here. It automatically authenticates for us. Um, so we don't have to worry about that at all. And we check if the status code is 200, just like we did before, get the resource and print out the title. To get Archive Snake, um, and to be fair, this is the same way you get requests, uh, ideally. Um, from a system that has a working Python 3 install, you can just do pip install Archive Snake, and it should automatically fetch it and install it in your Python um, so that you can use it. To configure Archive Snake, by default, it will look in your home directory um, for a file called .archivesnake.yaml. Um, where you can put uh, a bunch of values that are described in the documentation for Archive Snake, but the important ones are the base URL, username, password, and a logging configuration. Um, the default logging configuration is probably fine for um, simple use cases uh, also. So when you're working with the API, there's essentially four kinds of things you're gonna be doing most, um, which are getting stuff, deleting stuff, changing stuff, and creating new stuff. Um, all the few further examples assume that you've imported the async client and created one. Um, and it also in most of the following examples, I've omitted the error checking. Don't omit error checking when you're writing scripts. Uh, it always check the status code to see if things completed successfully, etc. Um, you want, generally when you're scripting, you want something to fail as soon as po pos as close as possible to where the thing went wrong, or you want to handle it as soon as possible to when the thing went wrong. So to get a record via Archive Snake, um, you pass just the URI into the client um, and get the JSON from it by using .json here. Um, and then you can do whatever you want with the resource. Um, if you wanted to get several records um, that are in a paged route, you'd use for resource in client get paged, um, the resources index route, um, and do something with each resource. Note that at Harvard, uh, re uh, repository 24 is Toten, so this would take a very long time and is probably not the best use of, uh, and, and you'd probably want to do something a little more, um, a little speedier. If you want to delete things, you just do client.delete, and that will send a delete request to repositories 24. Probably don't want to do that. That, that, that seems a little risky, but uh, there's, there's things you should delete. Uh, you know, the biggest repository at your institution is not one of them. To change stuff, it's a little more complicated. Um, essentially, what you want to do is get the resource as demonstrated earlier, and then change whatever you want inside that resource. And then you want to post that back to the resource, the resources URI. So you use the URI from the resource in the as the um, as the URI to post to, and then you pass in the resource in the JSON uh, JSON argument here, which basically serializes whatever object you give it as JSON in the body of the um, of the request. To create new stuff, you um, you simply post to the index route here with a, um, in Python it'd be a dictionary, but with an object that serializes to, to JSON um, with the fields that you want in the um, final object in the system. Um, what you get back when you post a create is you get back a, um, an object that describes the status of what happened, um, gives you the ID of the returned object and the URI of the returned object, um, and tells you if there were any war warnings, um, et cetera. Uh, if, if it hadn't succeeded, you'd get back a, a similar response that had a list of the errors that happened. So logging. Um, Archive Snake has a built-in logging facility. This, this might be the section of the code that I, I spent the most uh, intense 
focus on getting right and uh, building. It's surprising, like logging is a surprisingly complex topic, but it's something that is intensely, intensely useful and will just save you a lot of time and trouble. Um, to set up a logger in Archive Snake, you import asnake.logging. I usually give it a shorter name. Um, and then you run setup logging. Here I'm logging to a file name, uh, mycoollogfile.log, and then create a logger. Um, and you want to give it a unique name that says, this is my scripts logger. Um, if you're writing a really complex script, you might create a couple of loggers with different names. Um, and then just when you want to actually log something, you use that logger and you can use info, debug, or other log levels available in Python. Um, uh, you give the event a name um, and then you can pass any, pretty much anything you want, you can pass as, a, uh, as an additional keyword argument and that'll be uh, encoded in the log along with time with uh, timestamps and uh, uh, some other information of use. Logging is is really really important. Like I I I can't over I can't emphasize that enough. Logs are the audit trail. They're what we did. They're error reporting. What went wrong. And they're a bookmark mechanism uh, if you write them correctly and are um, careful about it. Because if you know where you left off, a lot of times you can skip through all of the things you've already hit and resume something. Um, this this has turned um, th this can save like hours or even days of effort if you've got very large batch jobs that you're processing. So um, where do you go from here? Um, the Archive Space API docs are the sort of primary documentation resource for working with the API. Um, they have a list of, of all the routes in the system, um, a searchable index, um, and they have, for each route, they have documentation on what parameters the route takes, what it returns, um, they're an invaluable resource. Um, they're automatically generated and they're guaranteed to have documentation for every endpoint defined in the system. The quality of documentation may vary by endpoint. Um, there's some things that just aren't, aren't documented terribly well by the automatic docs. Um, there's currently a project um, which I'm, I'm part of to manually document uh, more of them uh, to make this better for people. Um, if you run into an underdocumented one at this point, I think actually you should just email me and I'll add it to the list and uh, try and get through it. Um, one thing that I don't have time to demonstrate here, but um, in cases where there's not sufficient documentation, um, it's actually often useful to go into the source code of the application and just find the um, find the definition of the function. And all those live in backend controllers or backend app controllers. Um, but that's that's sort of uh, we're gonna move on now. Um, so the archive snake docs are available online also. The README, in addition to having the documentation on how to get started and use Archive Snake, has a big list of projects that use Archive Snake um, that you can use as examples or um, sometimes even just take and repurpose for your own use. Um, there's also a big list of prior art in various languages, things that um, people were doing either before Archive Snake or were doing that didn't use Archive Snake, but were also scripting around the API. Um, there's also a set of developer-centric docs that describe the internal methods and functions of Archive Space at a very low level. If you're a um, if you're once you get more comfortable that that will probably be useful um, it's useful to keep it to read through the docu the documentation on the solder on the solar edis max query language uh, there's meant to be a space between edis max and query there um, essentially the Search is, is in a lot of cases going to be the fastest way to get large collections of records that match a specific criteria. Um, 
and the search routes, um, once you know how to use them, they're, they're very valuable. But um, the document, like the documentation that you need to be able to know what to put in queue uh, is, is the solar documentation there. Um, all right, thank you. Um, my name is Dave Mayo. Um, please don't hesitate to email me with any questions um, uh, or, or like, uh, think I, I'm going to provide the slides and um, the Jupyter Notebook I built the slides from. And uh, now we'll move to taking questions directly. All right. Thank you, Dave. That was great. And we have a lot of conversation happening in the chat, which is really exciting. Um, I will say we're going to be doing an encore presentation of this. It will be the recording, not Dave Live, at what will be 1 a.m. Eastern time tonight or early tomorrow morning. So if any of you are night owls or insomniacs, uh, please feel free to join again and have another great conversation. This is awesome. Uh, so the first question is from Matthew, and I will say um, for some of these questions, instead of just butchering them with me reading them, I may ask uh, individuals to unmute themselves to ask questions, so um, please do that. But, but Matthew asks, if updating is done by post, then must you supply the full JSON representation of the thing you're updating, even if many of the fields are staying the same? Uh, and then Greg uh, says in the chat, Dave, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you need all the required fields in the JSON you're posting. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, the there's no there's no meaningful patch support, um, and and yeah, so updates are are post the changed object uh, as you intend to see it. Um, I think I think there are some cases where it won't necessarily alter what's there if you don't have a property that's not required um, but in practice it's it's generally best to just get the object make the mute modifications and then post it back up okay, thanks uh, Greg says there is an endpoint to get a list of fields and one of the things I'm excited to get into archive snake is a method for creating empty objects using that endpoint um, so you could see resource.new or something similar before editing and posting. That's uh, not a question, but I agree with it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then Corey, um, you ask about a script that you're writing, trying to do what Matthew referenced. Do you want to maybe unmute yourself and talk about that? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, basically, what I was trying to do with my script was to uh, mass publish a bunch of names. Uh, so I was looking at like the JSON schema, I, I believe. That's what it's called. Um, and trying to change one of the fields to just uh, say, like, is publish or something true? Um, but I was having difficulty passing the uh, the the JSON as a parameter. Um, I have a theory as to what's going on. Were you were you basically trying to put it in the params argument? Yes, yes, I was. So one of the things that's not signaled out terribly well in the documentation right now, um, and that I, I uh, think we should address at some point, um, the post, a lot of the post methods in particular, um, what they what they want is not actually to have it passed as a parameter. What they want is to have it passed in as the body of the post request, um, which uh, the way you do that in Archive Snake and requests is by um, if assuming it's JSON, which it almost always is in the case of Archive Snake uh, and Archive Space. Um, you pass a separate argument that's a that's JSON equals the object that you want to have serialized as JSON, and that passes it in as the body rather than as in in a named parameter. Did that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah. Um, one thing to watch out for there, though, is when you're doing the search routes and passing in the advanced query, it actually does expect the advanced query to be a serialized, like to be serialized JSON passed in as a parameter, um, which is uh, sort of like the one place I know that uh, you actually do stuff JSON in one of those parameter values. Yeah, I think it's just search routes, but there might be others. I don't know. But um, primarily, you're going to be passing it as the body. 
um, for anything that's a post request. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Chris points out the API error messages are also really verbose. So if you try to post an incorrectly formatted item, it'll usually tell you enough about the schema to fix it, like such and such field is required, or this field should be a list and you put in a string, et cetera. That's a really good point. Um, and then uh, Greg in the chat has also offered some advice to Corey and what he's trying to do. Um, and points to uh, the Archive Snake GitHub for, for some resources. Um, Seth uh, says, in my experience, if you get more results than you expected, it's because there are PUI only duplicates. Yeah, that's definitely a that's definitely a thing that can happen. Um, yeah, the index stuff is is uh, I sort of figured it was a little over um, over what I could cover in the time allotted. So, uh, but uh, definitely a lot of a lot of useful stuff comes out of the index, but all index, but also it's it's where a lot of the less predictable behavior um, around searches happens. Thanks. Yeah, and Seth also says we also use PHP. Um, all right, and then Corey has posted also, Corey, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself again about what the difference is between uh, two different searches. Right, sorry about that. That's, that's a quickie one. Uh, it was just, I was asking uh, Dave on, on his slides, put a uh, a dot JSON uh, parentheses where I was trying to do really not fancy stuff with uh, returned results um, from from a get request. It was like dot content dot decode and JSON load s and it's just very not pretty. So dot yeah. JSON looks a lot <laughs> more pretty. Yeah, and um, this this actually brings up something that I I think was a really useful thing to cover, which is um, at the archive snake uh, client layer, which is what I've been demonstrating here, um, archive snake is essentially just returning a request response object. So if you want to see what you can do with something that's returned from the API in archive snake, um, you can just look at the requests documentation for that. Um, all of the HTTP methods in archive snake are actually forwarded, like are actually forwarded methods from requests. Um, the only thing they do differently is they they basically prepend the API parameter and they re um, and they re execute if they uh, if the session is um, if you lose authentication because the session times out. Um, otherwise, they're just the same as requests .get pull URL to the thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that made sense. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, and uh, Greg points out in the chat, um, there is a great Slack. It's called Archivist Working with Archival Data that um, anyone can join. Uh, it's a really good place to ask API related questions. Um, Jen asks, Greg, how would I request access to that Slack? Uh, if I remember correctly, you would go and request access and there's like a Google form that you fill out and you're given access. I think that's correct. Um, Andrew asks, I haven't seen an obvious way to link objects via the API. For example, do you have any tips for creating a top container and associating it with one or more archival objects? Uh, sorry, repeat that. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I saw you were in the chat. Um, I haven't seen any obvious way to link objects via the API. For example, do you have any tips for creating a top container and associating it with one or more archival objects? All right. So um, I'm going to see if uh, do, 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 uh, I ignore what's on my screen for the moment, um, but uh, da, 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 da. 
Space. Actually, wait. I I will look at this in a uh, in a venue where I can actually like um, make the make the text bigger. Um, Sorry, I will stop talking to myself someday. That's irritating. Uh, doo -doo. So um, essentially what you need to do to do that um, is you basically need to get the objects and then um, and then post e and then post both sides of the um, the thing. Let me see if I can actually find where this is happening. So basically, um, uh, I think this is too complex to actually show. So I'm just going to talk it out. Um, basically, what you would do if you wanted to link top containers to archival objects is you'd need to have the um, the URIs for the top containers and the URI for the archival object, you'd get the top containers and archival objects and you'd essentially edit the top container so that it had the archival object linked to it. And then you'd edit the archival object so it had the top container linked to it. Um, the, pro like, um, I think, I can I can give you like a concrete example of this, but I think it's uh, going to have to be offline. Um, so email me and I'll um, I'll work something up. Um, but essentially, the the top like top containers and uh, I think archival objects and digital objects um, like having to alter both sides of it to link them is is not necessarily ideal, but it's it's how things currently work. Um, you basically just um, add the URI for the thing you're linking into the proper like property on the object that you're linking it to on both sides of the connection. Um, if you want to unmute, uh, did that uh, did that make sense? Um, uh, yes, look at the general principle. Thanks very much. Yeah, and I'll um, I'll link. I'm not sure, like the, it's the thing that I have that's doing that is kind of um, like is doing a lot and it, it has a lot of XML, like uh, Excel processing code. Um, so I, I'll, I'm going to post that in the, uh, bas basically email me and I'll, I'll send you a link to that, but also I'll write a more minimal example of it. That'd be great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, Andrew, I think that you would find um, Shoes Untied, which is the, the Slack that Greg referred to, really useful. It's a great place to, to ask questions like that, a good resource. All right. Corey said, agreed. It's a fantastic place. Yeah, it's inhabited by archivists. It's wonderful. Um, we aren't getting any other questions in the chat. Uh, so I will go ahead and thank all of you for being here, uh, for sticking it out through until the bitter end of this three hour block. And uh, thank you, especially today for this. This was really great. It was something that has been requested by the community uh, several times recently. And it's something that I have been hoping to host. So I'm so glad that Dave was available to do it. Um, and like he said, his uh, presentation slides and resources will be made available with the recording when that becomes available on the wiki. So with that, I will thank you all and I will see you at the next Archive Space event. Thanks everyone. Thanks.